fronts and much thank you. You know, I'm one of the dinosaurs here. Um, thanks that I'm back again. It's like home. <laughs> Open prostatectomy, quality assurance. Peter, thank you very much for this, I think, very good lecture. And I think we're very close together. I have no disclosure to make. I'm an open surgeon trained by my great boss, Hartwig Huland. But what are we talking about today? I think the question is how to measure quality. Which trial do we need to really tell is one technique better than the other? And one important question you already raised, how should we teach our uh, residents? How do we do the training? And of course, for me as an open surgeon, I always ask myself, is open prostatectomy out? Well, I love open radical prostatectomy and, well, and you showed this slide. I think we really can agree. You have better vision, you can make better videos. There is less bleeding, less post-operative pain, shorter hospital st uh, stay, less scaring, better cosmetic outcomes. But I think the most important questions are, what about surgical outcome, what about functional outcome? And I, will, I have a different view and I think we really have to discuss this. When I talk to friends, they always ask me, Peter, do you already have a robot? And I say, no, I don't have a robot. So I feel like the guy in the small Italian car and you know the Da Vinci people are behind me, sponsored by ADAC, and the German people know this is not really always good. <laughs> well, when I talk to the intuitive people, they tell me in the US, 90% of all radical prostatectomies are done by the Da Vinci. But how are the real numbers? And I think this was a very good paper published in Journal of Urology last year. And what you can see, this is total number of all radical prostatectomies. The red line is open prostatectomy. And indeed, it's going down. And this is the number of robotic prostatectomies. But still, even in the US, open is there. And what is the chance that a physician will do all robotic cases? depending on age and you know I'm somewhere here between 50 and 60 and my chance that I will switch is around 10 percent. And I think this is a question every surgeon asks himself. How do I know if I'm really good? And I think we need this feedback and I th thought this paper was very good published in European Urology and well they you can measure all different outcomes like biochemical recurrence rate, urinary function rate, erectile function rate, perioperative outcomes, the positive surgical margin rate, inappropriate surgery rate, and so on. And I think every surgeon should have this information for himself. And this is from Memorial. And for every surgeon, he can go back and look, where do I stand? And I think it's important that we get this feedback, that we know what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses and where do we have to improve. And we need good trials, we need randomized trials and this is from Australia and this is a study protocol and they have a hypothesis. They, have, they will randomize 200 people, 200 patients in each arm and that's their hypothesis. No difference in terms of surgical and clinical indices for oncological outcome. The robotic prostatectomy patients improved short-term quality of life. Open prostatectomy patients comparable medium and long-term outcomes. No difference regarding psychological distress, cancer-specific distress and decision-related distress and there will be a short-term and overall cost advantage for open prostatectomy. So we will see. But right now, is it really the technique or is it the surgeon? And we all know there are differences in um, surgical behavior. And this is another paper from the European Urology. 
cancer control and functional outcomes after radical prostatectomy as marker of surgical quality, analysis of heterogeneity between surgeons. And these were ch surgeons open and laparoscopic and robotic. And you know these results. The outcome really varies by surgeon. And um, volume really plays a role. The bigger the circle, the higher the number of cases. And you see mostly surgeons with a big um, operating load are doing very well. There are some surgeons, they don't do so many cases, but still can do good work. But most of the, case, most of the um, surgeons who do a few cases have not so good results. So the patient's likelihood of recovering erectile and urinary function may differ depending on which of two surgeons performs his radical prostatectomy. So it's not the technique, it's the surgeon. And functional preservation does not appear to come at the expense of cancer control, rather both are related to surgical quality. And of course there's always a best case scenario. So patient selection really plays a role and I mean if you have a best case scenario, you know, medium sized prostate, slim patient, no previous surgery, white bony pelvis, no fibrosis, it's Wednesday morning, 10.30, you're in a good mood, and the nicest scrub nurse from Braunschweig is on the table. You know this will be a great case. I mean, no, no matter if this is open or laparoscopic or robotic. Um, so we all know there's also a learning curve, and you already mentioned this. And the learning curve really plays a major role in functional outcomes as well as oncologic outcomes. And again, predicted probability of recurrence at five years really depends on your surgical learning curve. And the same is true for functional outcome. So as a surgeon's experience increase, cancer control improves. And I think you, everybody will agree. There are many trials and many papers on systematic review and meta-analysis, and I would like to show you a few of these papers. This paper looks at positive surgical margin rate, many trials between 2004 and 2011, and it seems it favors robotic um, radical prostatectomy. Well, this is one of the most recent papers I found, published one month ago in the Journal of Endourology, so a journal for robotic surgeons. And it's the Columbia University database, so I think a pretty good hospital. And they looked at positive surgical margin rate and what they found, the hazard ratio for positive surgical margin was higher in men after robotic surgery. And when you look at biochemical survival, open prostatectomy did better than robot prostatectomy. So the most recent data I could find. Continence rate, when you look at these meta-analysis, it favors robotic. But again, I would like to show you one paper from the JCO. And I think this is a very good paper because it's a population-based random sample from 20% of Medicare patients. So they did a male survey. So they sent out a mail to patients and they responded. And they had a response rate of 86%, which I think is pretty good. So the results, I think we can really trust. So response, and they ask regarding continence as well as sexual function. Is there no problem or big problem? And for continence, you see open. 8.9% of the patients say, I have a big problem with continence. 11.7% say after robotic surgery. So, well, when you look at sexual function, big problem after open, it's not as good as with uh, robotic surgery. So I think 
we can really learn from these results that I think both techniques may be very similar and there may be no difference or maybe even um, in favor of open surgery. And again, they did a logistic regression prediction of the chance of having moderate or big problem with continence and robotic surgery was worse. And you all know this paper, Satisfaction and Regret After Open Rate Repubic or Robotic Assisted Lapro Laparoscope Radical Prostatectomy. And what it shows, regret three times more likely after robotic surgery. This may be due to um, expectation, which you cannot fulfill. However, it shows open prostatectomy is still there. And again, this is, I think, a very nice um, meta-analysis, and Peter Wicklund was senior author. They looked at 167,000 open radical prostatectomy, 57,000 laparoscopic, and 62,000 robotic patients. And it demonstrates that robotic surgery is at least equivalent in terms of margin rate and suggests it provides certain advantages. Well, you also state the lack of randomized controlled trials, use of margin status as an indicator of oncologic control, and inability to perform cost comparison are limitations of the study. But I think there's always a problem when you read these trials, because what are the disclosure? And I looked at the disclosure at the end of this article, and then you read two of the authors are paid employees by Intuitive. Ashtewari has received grants from Intuitive, consultant fees from Intuitive. Only Peter has nothing to declare. That's the reason why I trust you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> But I think this is always the problem when you read meta-analysis. Of course there is a bias. And when you have a paper and two of the authors are paid employees by the company who sells the system, you should ask yourself, is this really true, what they are telling you? Well, this is positive surgical margin rate, open, robotic, and it seems there is a benefit for uh, the robotic system. And also you showed the blood transfusion rate. Open, robotic, 16.5% transfusion rate for open prostatectomy. Marcus, how is the transfusion rate in Hamburg for open prostatectomy? About 2%. Okay. We have the same. So it's not 16%. So I think we are very close to this number. And length of stay open in the United States, 3.1, length of stay for robotic, non-United States, four days. So it really depends on the health system. And of course, patients are doing better after robotic surgery. You can send them home earlier. But does it really play a major role? I'm not so sure. And when you look at complication rates, well, post-operative complication rates after open surgery in this paper, 11% compared to 9% robotic. But when you look, what are the complication rates in this paper? It says respiratory uh, complications where you see the biggest difference between open and robotic, and I do not understand these figures. So, what about costs? You already talked about costs, and of course, costs play a role. And, you know, in Germany, when I tell my director, I would love to have a machine like this, he tells me, Peter, how should we pay for this? I mean, tell me, does more money come in, and what are the reasons for me to buy this machine? And you already heard these numbers, and you all know these numbers. The system is around between two and three million dollars. The procedure, finally, it's around 10,000 euros. Yeah. However, 
You can also calculate additional costs. And I think in this paper from England, um, cost for complications can be listed. Um, cost for, for example, conversion to open prostatectomy and so on. And you can really bring this down. So in this paper published last year in European Neurology, it was um, robotic prostatectomy was more costly than laparoscopic as well as open. However, the higher cost of robotic prostatectomy may be offset by modest health gain resulting from lower risk of early harms and positive margin. Considerable uncertainty persists in the absence of direct comparative randomized data. I think one major point is training, and you already mentioned this, and I think with training, I fully agree, this is better with robotic. You can really train people much better with robotic surgery. And there are many papers they show when you do training before surgery, your results are better. I think this was a very nice um, paper. They looked at virtual reality robotic surgery warm-up, where they asked the surgeons to do a warm-up before they do the case. And what they found, it reduced errors in a complex task, suggesting the generability of the warm-up. So before you do surgery, you should do a warm-up like the football player before they do the, the soccer game. And again, surgical stimulation, I think, is a way forward to do training. And with this um, surgical stimulation, you are really able to do good training. And there are different machines. It's Da Vinci and different other machines, and it really helps to improve the skills of your trainees. And I think this is really the way forward. And I was really shocked when I read this paper, and this is the last paper I would like to show you today. Um, it was an analysis of the American College of Surgeons, and it looked surgical trainee involvement. And they looked at a big number of cases, open, robotic, laparoscopic uh, surgery, and when a trainee was involved in the operation, there was a higher incidence of bleeding overall and serious morbidity. So, this compares operations with a resident, that's the black bar, and without a resident, um, the white bar. And regarding overall morbidity, serious morbidity, as well as bleeding, when there was a trainee involved, the complication rate was higher. So this really emphasizes the importance of training of our residents. And I think their virtual reality is the future. So this is my conclusion. I hope I could show you that open prostatectomy is not out. There is, of course, a current trend in shifting standard of care for radical prostatectomy from open to robotic-assisted approach. Continuous quality assessment is absolutely necessary, and we need a prospective data management. And every surgeon should know his results and should know where should he or she should improve. And I think this is absolutely mandatory. We have to improve our training for residents. Thank you very much. I cannot agree more with the two of you. And uh, so, Peter, would you please come up as well? And uh, this is open to discussion now. Any questions? So maybe I, have, uh, maybe I have a question. I have a question to the floor. Who is doing on a regular basis radical prostatectomies? Who is doing a constant quality control of you? Who is doing that like every half year, sitting together with your colleagues, comparing the, the results. Who's doing that? Oh, that's very good. I'm impressed. Very good. Because I think that's a very important message you just gave to us. Peter, you had a... Yeah, I have a question to both of you. You mentioned the quality control, and um, you also mentioned that simulators, things like this, are the future we have to go. 
and you showed a very nice slide what the learning curve is in laparoscopic surgery versus robotic surgery. It's no question, we don't do robotic surgery that often in Germany because of the costs. That's the only reason. There is no other reason. And this is, this is incredible, I would say, because it's the best thing you can do. He has shown, you have shown many things that are coming up, advanced uh, reality, et cetera, et cetera, all these things which will show up in the future. But the most important thing, I think, is who is really controlling surgery? Every pilot, when you get into an airplane, has to be trained, has to show up. Um, every year, I think it is so and so many hours on a simulator to demonstrate that he is able to handle such an aircraft. We are not doing this for surgery, but we are able, we would be able to do that with such kind of simulators. I think it's time to start this kind of business. What do you think about it? I, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, in, in our institution, when we got the first robot, we started to work like that. So we, all the surgeons who start robotic surgery will have their own results, you know, margin rate, continence, potency, and complications back. And we sit down. And this was the major reason for the improvement in our outcome when we s switched the program. I don't think the robot itself was the major issue, but the, the, the quality control of the program. So you benchmark every surgeon and you compare to all the others. And this is very, very important. And when you start to learn robotic surgery at Karolinska now, because we have two international fellows and also train our own residents in robotic surgery, we have a very strict step-by-step -step type of protocol that you go through to avoid this learning curve effect so that you start only with doing one part of the... Uh, you assist for 50 or 100 operations before you do anything to understand the robot and the port placement and the angles of the arms and all these things. And then you do only one part of the operation until you know it, and then you go to the next part, and you never do the whole operation until you know all the different parts. And then you, after like six months console training, you can do a case. So, and I think this is very important if you want to train people without having a, a, a I mean, maybe you'll have a slight learning curve anyhow, because the nerve sparing is so very, very precise if you want to be in the right plane. But the lear learning curve will be much, much better. And okay. well, uh, just one comment. Yesterday we, we heard from the US that the mean number was six cases uh, per surgery, or three, three cases. Wow, okay. Two years. So I think this is a disaster. You cannot produce quality if you do less than 10 cases or less than. Yeah. But I mean, this is yeah. relates to the, the, the paper you showed mm. from the Medicare, mm. and you see the robotic outcome is actually not that good. Mm. And that is, of course, because now in the United States, the, the, the guys doing open surgery are the ones that resist and are doing a lot of cases and they are good surgeons because the surgeon is a much bigger risk factor than the technique. So a good open surgeon will always beat a mediocre robotic surgeon. So I think it's, it's a, once you learn a technique, if you are a very good open surgeon, you're too old to change probably. So there's a, there's a, there's a comment you're from a good my open surgeon. <laughs> I, I would like to make a general comment. I agree with you that robot, in my point of view, is a future and in five years, ten years, it will be with the overwhelming uh, type of procedure. However, we all, I think, have a bad feeling. If you want to introduce, for example, in my country, a new medication, you have to have many, many things to do to prove that the medication is good, to pay a randomized trial, to go to the EMA, the European uh, FDA, then in my country, even after that, you have to go to the Gemeinsame Bundesausschuss, the GBA, and after all of that, you may introduce a new medication. Here, a very expensive procedure was introduced like that. And now we start to show, is it really better, better? That is a bad feeling we all have about it. Yeah, I, I agree also on that, but that's, that's our own fault, because we don't have a stable platform. So we don't have a body that controls what the surgeons, as we discussed already, I mean, there is no control. How are you supposed to train in surgery? How do you evaluate surgery? So since we are working in almost like a Wild West type of uh, thing, you can operate, you can do whatever you like. Then when you introduce something, how can you introduce it in another way? It's almost impossible, and that is our own fault. So we don't have like in the... the uh, airline industry, for instance, or the airline, the pilots, how they are tested and trained, and, because they have much, much better system. We should change our system to, for training and, and all that, but it will take a long time because we are all 
we have grown up in this system and we okay. we know how to use it yeah. but it's i agree with you it's a very sort of unstable uh, yeah, we have actually there are so many people who want to say something. We have two questions, two yeah. short questions, and Jonas wanted to ask something. Let and then me go about now the, the training. There is now in the United States a new certification coming up for robotics, which is called Fundamental in Robotic Surgery. And this may cross to Europe in the next two years. We just gathered in Paris on the 30th of January with a number of robotic surgeons. We had Rick Satava who was there, and he was talking about all the process that got on. This is now urged by Intuitive because Intuitive has 1,700 cases, process cases against them and one class action against them. And now they realize that they have to get a certification like the pilots do get it every six months, not every year, but every six months. Mm. Otherwise, you would never go on the plane. Mm. So this is coming up and this is, I think, very important. Yeah, I totally and agree. actually, we should discuss because we need people from Germany in that group. There were many French people, a few Netherlands people, and I would like to, s to speak with some of you about that because we must get together regarding this crossing over of the fundamentals in robotic surgery. But mm. this is already a, a work in progress. There is a scientific, no, there is a, uh, there is a working group within ERUS with Hank van der Poel and uh, Alex Motri and so on that are setting up the ERUS, you know, where you're supposed to go online. And so th this is, uh, there's a lot of work in this area for robotic surgery right now in Europe, in, inside EAU. Uh, I just have a comment about all these studies comparing open and robotic. And we all agree that they have quite low quality. And I was asked uh, in Sweden to uh, review all these. And I reviewed 29 of these studies comparing. And afterwards, I was not very impressed, I must say. And one important thing was that of those 29 papers I reviewed, 27 of them had a robotic surgeon as the first author. And I think these are the enthusiasts who ev evaluated their own techniques uh, regarding the open surgery. So they are the enthusiasts comparing. So I think all these studies have a low quality. But the problem is, me and Peter, we have tried really in Sweden to make a good study. But I think it's very, very difficult because what are you comparing? Are you comparing technique or are you comparing surgeons with each other? And I'm not convinced we will ever, ever get an answer about what is technique, what is surgeon. And I think we have to live with this in the future. I, I cannot really see how that ideal study would be where we actually look on these different uh, techniques. We, we know from the Swedish data that the surgeon is a much greater risk factor than the mm. technique, you know, so, mm. it's, so the variability between surgeons is huge, you know, re so, regardless so whether it's robot or open. Yeah, so we should actually have another focus, I think. As Marcus said, we should look much more for the quality and work more because the quality differs so much in all these centers and that's much more important for the patients what we, which techniques we actually choose. Thank you. Thank you much for this closing word. We have to carry on. 